Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Joff Jubert and today I'm going to be walking you through a kind of tutorial on using meta-labeling to solve for the problem of non-stationarity and position sizing. I'm one of the co-founders of a private research group called Hudson and Thames and we really focus on implementing the, you know, really the most recent academic literature with respect to financial machine learning. And all of our implementations are available on GitHub in a Python package called MRF and Lab. So any, anyone in the audience can you know, just import our package, use it, um, there's a ton of examples there. And, and, and that's kind of what, what we're well known for. And then we built this package with the, our foundations being the, the two textbooks from Marcus Lopez, the Prado Advances in Financial Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Asset Managers. And once we incorporated really the majority of those techniques, we then started to move into implementing several other uh, researchers and any kind of really useful tool we could find in, in academic journals, namely the, the Journal of Financial Data Science and the Journal of Portfolio Management. And our most useful tools are portfolio optimizers. We have a whole family of, of hierarchical portfolio optimizers, measures of codependence, labeling, uh, and feature importance techniques. It's actually a really cool feature importance techniques, which I'll highlight very lightly later on. Um, called the model fingerprint, which, which gives a lot of interpretability. Um, but let's get started. So a quick overview of, of the lecture I'm going to be giving today. So we're going to be focused on, on, on meta-labeling and how it helps us to solve two problems. Uh, the first being the problem of non-stationary data. Um, and the second one being, okay, well, we have the, the side of our position that we need to take, and now we need to determine you know, what is the size of, of this position? And so ideally, the more confident our model is, the more or the higher the, the position we, we'd like to weight. And if our model is not very confident, we want to decrease um, that, that, that position. And so in this way, meta-labeling helps us to address both situations. And then we can, we can use this model output uh, and strap on the Kelly criterion to figure out what the optimal position sizing is. So first of all, the, the, what is the problem of non-stationarity? So in finance, we have this problem where the underlying data generating process, f of x, is changing through time. And because of that, uh, specific characteristics such as mean, variance, and covariance are also evolving over time. Uh, and this, this makes it rather hard for us to kind of model. You know, we've got this problem, you know, people often talk about uh, we've got these different types of regimes and, and different models perform differently in various regimes. And if you can identify what regime you're in, you can you know, apply the model that works best in that regime. Um, and it's very important to highlight that, you know, most machine learning models assume that the data is generated using an independent and identically distributed process, um, you know, which, which a lot of people for, forget about. So, you know, why, why do we get these, you know, kind of structural break regimes? You know, how is this, this data generating process changing through time? And there are a couple of fundamental reasons. You know, first of all, you can move from something such as an open outcry to an electronic system. Um, you can move from a single exchange to having multiple exchanges across various locations, opening, you know, have, having room for things like geographic arbitrage. Um, and you also get into intro, intro, the in, introduction of new trading strategies such as high frequency trading uh, or even use mach using machine learning or you know any kind of advanced new techniques that come out that weren't used before and we can identify different types of regimes you know we'll, we'll so often they're referred to as kind of you know trending or mean reverting um on the plot over here i i show kind of you know the daily percentage changes of the s p 500 uh, and you and you can see, you know, when we look at this, we can see that we experience volatility clustering, um, and we get we experience periods of kind of you know low volatility that explode seem to explode, you know, into these periods of higher uh, volatility. You know, some people would think that the market moves in in this random walk fashion, and when new information enters, it will kind of you know move towards the new price equilibrium using um, some stochastic um, process. And also, you know, we we can identify things like uh, recessions and, and, and panic periods. And so, you know, we can look at the, the, the great recession or even now with COVID-19, you know, we've also got kind of panic environment and, and markets behave differently um, during these situations. And so on this chart over here, I just show structural breaks where, where every single line here introduces kind of a, a structural break um, that occurred. Now, this may mean that the model you have trained may have like a spike in its error term and, and will stop working in the near future. Um, over here, unsupervised learning is used to help 
try and identify the different types of trends. So for example, where you see the turquoise color, that, that is highlighting like one specific set of market conditions. Um, and so, you know, this, this is kind of an, an open research area uh, where people are trying to identify regime structural breaks uh, and how can we adapt to them. So when I, in my early career, I was introduced to the technique of, you know, building models using this online machine learning framework. And so a really good example of this is um, Amazon. Right. So you go on Amazon and you purchase a couple of things and they need to figure out, OK, what item do we need to recommend this type of user? Um, and so what their algorithms are, have this online fashion, their model parameters are being updated um, constantly in time so that their models can adapt to, to new and changing fashion trends. Um, and so when approaching the problem of, OK, we've trained a model on some data. And it's now some kind of structural break. The market is, is fundamentally different in this next period and our model starts performing worse. You know, do we, now we need to retrain. And so one way to kind of solve this problem is, is by using an online machine learning framework. Now, uh, these, these slides were, were graciously led to me uh, by a friend, Stuart Reed, um, from a lecture he gave at Dendaba X in 2018. And, and, and so what he's done here is he's showing the fixed window size versus the increasing window size online machine learning techniques. And so in the fixed window size, what we do is you will train a model for this period and then you know, you'll score, you keep using it until you've got enough data and then you'll basically kind of you know, only train on this data, use this data to update your model parameters. And this doesn't have to be fixed in, in, in this sense in that you know, it, it trains over here and then you'll train it again over here, uh, we'll retrain it for, with this data. Um, you know, this, this could be a rolling window. Um, and, and this has certain benefits. So one of the, the good things about using this technique is that it's using very little data to train on. And so your models are generally, you know, they train really fast uh, and, and your model is very quick to adapt to, to any changes it may be seen. Uh, alternative to this technique is to use the increase window size. So, you know, you start with a small training size and then you increase um, your window as, as you go through time. Now, the problem with this is that your, your data set is getting larger and you've also got a lot of data that may not be relevant for the, the market regime um, that you're in. So you may want to, you know, upweight more recent events and, and, you know, use some kind of decay function. Um, but this type of model will be slow to change. And so a really good example, actually, of, of what happens to us in practice is you've got a model, it's using an online framework, and all of a sudden a structural break occurs and you, you start losing money and you realize, okay, well, I need to switch the model off at this point. Um, and I need to wait for enough new observations to come for me to, to retrain and then hope that those observations are enough to define the kind of new regime that, that, that we're in. And, and so th that's one of the problems with, with using this online technique. Another technique we can use is a technique introduced by Marcos Lopez de Prado in his book, Advances in Financial Machine Learning. And this technique is known as meta-labeling. And the core idea is to train a secondary model to determine uh, kind of like in what states does your primary model not perform well in. And so the secondary model gives you a value of, of how confident your how confident it is that your primary model is correct. And so it tells you to trade or not to trade. Um, now, <clears throat> in this graph over here, I've, I've got an example of it, but perhaps I should first highlight the, the trading strategy developed up here. Now, I'm not a big fan of, of technical analysis, um, but I think it works really well to kind of show toy examples without adding unnecessary complexity. And so... The training strategy we're looking at here is pretty simple. It's a moving average crossover strategy. When the short-term moving average crosses above the um, long-term moving average, that would indicate um, you know, a positive trend and, and you should buy, go long. And if it crosses uh, from the top down, then it's a, a short signal. And so you can see that, that here, the, the red flags is indicating a short, the green flags are long. And <clears throat> these kind of training strategies are well understood. They, they, they don't necessarily have good sharp ratios and, and perhaps not many people use it professionally, but what this allows us to do is see, okay, this type of trading strategy will never perform well when markets are trending, when there's a strong upward trend or a strong downward trend where moving average crossover starts to suffer is when markets start going sideways. There's a lot of volatility, maybe zero correlation breaks down um, and then they, they, they over trade and, and they lose money. And so we're training a secondary model um, which evaluates a primary model gives a signal we try to determine, okay, given a certain market state by passing through features, um, you know, such as um, the, the drift or, or the variance of the market, 
uh, and various other features, we can then build another model that determines, oh, okay, under this state, uh, this model will perform well or not. And so the secondary model kind of tells us when to switch off our, our primary model when it identifies that you're in a different regime or in a state or if there's some kind of event that your model is not good at picking up. Um, now, I've seen different people. Um, so, so a general question for this is, okay, cool, but now what kind of features do you use to train the secondary model? So personally for me, I like using, I like at least passing through the features from my primary model. So whatever the, the feature uh, set was that we trained our primary model on, then I like to add additional features which define the market state. Um, you should add features which are indicative of false positives. I think volatility is a, is a really good measure here. For me, it comes up time and time again as, as an important feature. And I also like adding distribution related features, things like the skew and the ketosis. Um, maybe you, you can use certain algorithms to identify when a, when a new observation is part of a different distribution. Yeah kind of use that as a flag. And you can, of course, also use the recent model performance of your primary model, because you may find that your primary model goes through these periods of, you know, uh, it gets lots of trades correct, and then it gets lots of trades incorrect. And so if you also pass through the recent performance, you may be able to determine, oh, okay, there's this kind of pattern, or you know, if I've got three bad trades in a row, it's likely that my next trade is also going to be wrong, so, so downweight the position. Um, and one thing that's important to understand about meta-labeling is that in theory, it's a technique that you could apply on any primary model. And that primary model could be a discretionary trader, a technical trading rule, uh, maybe you know, a classical quant strategy such as factor investing or statistical arbitrage. It could be another ML model. Um, it really shines, in my opinion, when you have an underlying primary model, which is a machine learning model, uh, generally a, a classification model. Um, and what we're going to be doing is with the meta model is we're going to be making a trade off between recall and precision. So we're going to reduce the number of trades we make, but we're going to be more correct with those trades that we do make. So this is a, a general strategy framework. So in, in general, you know, we would have some raw data, <coughs> excuse me. We would apply some feature engineering that would go through to our primary model. In this case, we also have a meta model, which provides an auxiliary signal that would take in um, you know, your engineered features, maybe, maybe some raw data, the output of your primary model, and then both signals of the primary model and the meta model uh, would be combined, and that would go through then to position sizing and through to execution. Uh, and, and maybe you've got some transaction cost models or portfolio optimizers in between here. But this is, this is the general kind of strategy framework and how meta modeling would, would fit into it. Now, there are three important metrics to understand. Um, it's a bit much for us to go into detail now um, if this is the first time you've seen it, uh, but there are, this is a recording and you'll be able to go over this lecture any single time that you'd like. And the main, the main uh, classification metrics that you'll need is a confusion matrix. You need to understand uh, precision and recall and the relationship between true negatives, true positives, false positives, and, and false negatives. And then the receiving operating characteristic, the ROC curve, uh, and, and how it works. So before we get started on showing a finance example, um, we wrote a blog post some time ago um, showing how meta labeling can be used in, in non uh, financial problems because that's actually where I started using it. Uh, I was working at a machine learning consultancy and I started, <clears throat> I started to use uh, meta labeling to improve the performance of our models um, that weren't on financial data sets. And I think using the MNIST data is a really nice way to show how, how the model works. Um, now, for those of you that don't know, the MNIST data set is handwritten digits and it's a classification problem, a multi-class classification, where your model is trying to determine, okay, well, given an image of, of a number, what number is that between zero and nine? Um, in, in the case of why we picked it here, it's largely because the MNIST data set is considered a solved problem. Um, and so it's very easy to show, you know, with a basic model when you've got you know, extra performance, and, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So to put it in the context of meta-labeling, uh, we need to transform it down to a, a binary classification. And so we're only going to be trying to figure out, given, given a number between the only two choices, really, uh, a five and a three. And the reason we chose five and three is because in the MNIST data set, actually, the numbers five and three uh, often get incorrectly classified. And you can see so why here in, in this image. So on the left, we have the number five, then a three, 
And on the right, at first glance, it looks like a five, but it could also be a, a really poorly written um, three. And so, you know, with these, with these digits, you know, often a model can get these wrong. And so we're going to use meta labeling to identify uh, which are, are the correct threes. Um, and so I have a diagram over here on the right, which shows the model architecture. So we have features in this case, it's a 256 by 256 uh, matrix um, of, of black, white, grayscale um, features. And that gets flattened. So it becomes a 256 times 256, a large number. Um, one dimensional vector and that gets passed through to the primary model in our case a logistic regression and we simply determine you know is, is it a three or not a three then we train a secondary model which target variable is the meta labels which is was your primary model correct or incorrect to train this model the features that we we'll use are the features that we generated from our primary model plus um, one of the things to add here is that you need to lower the threshold of your primary model so that you can increase the recall. And so in the logistic regression, the value is going to be an output between zero and one with 0 0.5 generally being um, the mid level. So a value above 0 0.5 would indicate the positive label and a value below 0 0.5 would indicate the negative label. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're going to say, okay, well, I want you to lower that threshold from 0 0.5 to maybe 0 0.3 because I want you to increase the recall because we're going to do a trade-off in our secondary model where we're going to trade off recall for precision. And so you apply that and then you pass through the features down here into your secondary model and your secondary model forecast is your primary model correct or not. And then you combine both these labels and you say, okay, well, if both of them said it's a number three, then we say, okay, it's a three. In the trading context, this will be, okay, well, our primary model said go long. We pass it through our meta-labeling model. And if our meta-label also said, yes, it thinks this trade will be profitable, only then do you take a position. So this is just some very quick performance metrics on the MNIST data set that I ran. This is on a, on a test set. The model has never seen this. It was never trained on this. It was never validated on this. This is the very first time that the model scored this data. And so I have the base model predictions over here on the left and on the right, the, the meta label um, addition to it. So just looking over the confusion matrix in this context, it's true positives are bottom right and the true negatives are top left. And, and over here, this is the confusion matrix. And so we can see that in this case, the base model is getting 999 true positives, 700 true negatives, and it's getting 192 false positives. Now, what we want to do in our meta labeling is we want to move more of these 192 across over into our true negatives. And that's exactly what we can see here. So we, we apply meta labeling. This is on a test data set, um, totally out of sample. And we can see we've moved over a large number of the false positives over into the true negatives. And be because we've done this, we've boosted our precision. Our precision moves from 94 to 96. Remember our recall should drop, so that's what we're seeing, 96 to 95. We get a boost in our F1 score, which is the harmonic mean, and we can see very nicely that our accuracy has jumped from 89 to 95. So meta-labeling is adding value. It's working as expected, and um, it's many people have asked me kind of, oh, this is like a boosting algorithm, you know, a boosting ensemble where you're training, you know, additional other models on your data to kind of get a better fit. This is, this is actually quite different. Um, it's a secondary model and its only job is figuring out the, the false positives. The mechanics behind it, you know, is quite a bit different. Moving over to a trading example. So again, <clears throat> I use a very simple trading strategy uh, that uses Bollinger Bands. And again, it's just to illustrate um, on a toy example that meta labeling is adding value. Now, on the left-hand side here, so for those of you that are interested, uh, this is financial time series, the upper band, or these bands are, are the Bollinger Bands. And when price reaches the upper band, you would go short, excuse me, and you would sell as it tends towards the mean. And the same for you, you know, if it touches the bottom band, you'll go long and, and you, you'd sell as it gets closer towards the mean. Now, this trading strategy, in the context of meta-labeling, um, you need to remember that your primary model is always going to give the recommendation to trade because we don't yet have a mechanism to determine, you know, when to trade and when not to trade. And so that's what you can see over here. Everything is, is, is a one label that says, okay, always trade. In this particular strategy, there are 749 false positives. We want to move a number of those over to the true negatives. 
Uh, right now, this model only has a 16% accuracy. We apply meta-labeling, again, totally out of sample, test data. Uh, now we're able to see, okay, yes, we were able to move 500 of the false positives over into the true negatives. Our meta-labeling has literally identified 500 observations that are not good trades. As a trade-off, though, you see that a number of the, the good trades that you were getting are also, you know, close to about half of them are moved over here um, to our false negatives. Um, so yes, you, you are losing some trades, but your accuracy is up, your precision is up. And as a result of that, because you're getting more, more correct trades, your cumulative returns go up, your annualized volatility comes down, your sharp ratio naturally by virtue of that goes up. Our maximum drawdown in this case drops from 61 to 36. And because of that, our comma ratio jumps to 0 0.96. And also as a result, our value at risk um, reduces significantly. And so we can see how very important it is to, to be able to trade less, but when we do trade, be more sure that we're going to have a winning trade. Now, the output of, of your meta-labeling model, in our case, use the logistic regression. And so, like I mentioned, the value is between zero and one, and, and this is just the uh, sigmoid curve. And Lots of people will refer to your model output here as um, the probability, but it should really be pointed out that the output from the logistic regression is not, not a probability in the frequentist sense, in that if you get a probability or well, model output of 80%, it doesn't mean that 80% of the time, or you know, there's an 80% probability that you're gonna be correct. It's more like a model confidence. Uh, than, than a frequentist probability. And so we can turn to sklearn, sklearn as a, a built-in module, which allows us to calibrate uh, model outputs. And so that's what you can see over here on the right. This is a calibration plot from sklearn. And we have different algorithms here. We, we have a naive Bayes, logistic, uh, support vector machines, and a random forest. This diagonal line, if the, if, if the other data points lie on this diagonal line, it means that it's very close to the frequentist interpretation. So in this specific case, we can see logistic is, is, is pretty close, but the other algorithms are really quite far away. And so, and so you need to apply a transformation that says, okay, well, if we take your model output, apply this transformation, and, and now hopefully you get more of a frequentist uh, probability because we're gonna use that, excuse me, for our position sizing. Here again is just um, an example of applying the transformation. So we've got the different models. Um, there are two algorithms. So there's the isotonic and then the sigmoid transformation that you apply. And then here you can see, oh, we've, we've applied the transformation and, and now they lie much closer on the diagonal line. And so we can now use these outputs um, in the Kelly criterion. So moving over to the Kelly criterion, um, the Kelly criterion is a position sizing algorithm from uh, capital growth theory that, that says, okay, well, using this algorithm, there are no necessary um, guarantees of stability or, or how much money you'd make other than um, this algorithm makes more money than any other algorithm over a long enough or infinitely long uh, time frame. So um, Ed Thorpe is very popular for writing this specific paper, uh, the Kelly criterion in blackjack, sports betting, and the stock market. This, this paper is great. It's a little hard to read, but it's got everything that you need. I've added additional papers here, which would kind of help anyone get up to speed. But <clears throat> when we're dealing with the Kelly criterion, it's kind of split into, into uh, two main forms, and that's Kelly in continuous time, and then Kelly on um, a discrete two outcomes based um, event, kind of you know, like sports betting, where you have an outcome of winning and an outcome of losing, um, and we've got the odds, your win probability, and, and we can apply the formula. So in the context of betting, and, and you'll see this, um, this algorithm feature in a number of sources and, and also in, in the Prado's textbooks, um, you will recognize this formula as two times the probability of success minus one gives you the optimal position size. Now, this condensed formula is the Kelly criterion in a betting environment um, with even odds or symmetric payoffs. Now, we need to remember two things. One is that you're not in a betting environment. You know, for every dollar invested, you cannot lose the full dollar that you invest. And then the second one is that you're unlikely to have symmetric payoffs unless you very specifically, you know, set your take profit and stop loss levels to, to be symmetric. Um, and so when we move to an investment setting, this is actually the formula that you'll use over here where the optimal position size is your probability of success divided by 
the amount of money that you would lose in percentage terms minus your probability of losing divided by the percentage of your, your expected profit in percentage terms that you would make. And that would give you your, your optimal position size. And this, this will often tell you, you know, actually what is the optimal amount of leverage because often it's, it's going to gear you. Um, this is just an example over here where it's saying, okay, well, with the win probability of 0 0.57, if your odds are even, you know, you should only have a position size of 14% of your portfolio. Anything more, you, you'd be taking on more, more risk than you actually need to. Um, and so because now from using our probability calibration on our model outputs, we're now able to get P, which is our probability of success. We can plug it into this formula where we can get our loss percentage and profit percentage from our take profit and stop losses uh, in our trading strategies. Or if you have symmetric payoffs, you can use two times the probability of success minus one. Uh, and, and now you have your optimal position sizing. So what, what makes meta labeling hard? Because I've actually, um, when I first moved to London, I, I started my own consultancy and this was a technique that I, I offered my clients. Um, and I got a lot of good experience with applying meta labeling, how it works, what features you should use. Um, and, and these are a couple of things I learned. So the first one is if you have a client and they've performed their research via back testing, um, and because they've done this, they've built trading strategies um, and then they continue to tweak their parameters until they got a desired sharp ratio that they were looking for or drawdowns that, that you know, suited their needs. Uh, when they do this, you know, it's an overfit model to the data and it'll be very, very hard to get meta labeling to add value. Um, you will struggle to boost performance metrics um, of any overfit model. And that's because the model is, is unrealistically, you know, it's, it's, it's just unrealistically getting, you know, certain um, certain predictions uh, right when actually it would, it would in reality get them wrong. And so if you've got an overfit model, it's, it's super hard to get metal labeling to work. The, the second one is I've seen a lot of traders like applying this uh, vectorized backtest approach where you apply an element wise multiplication of your signal vector by the returns vector to get your strategy returns. Uh, and so by not treating every single trade as a single individual trade and measuring you know the performance relative to that trade that trade make money or not if, if you're using this kind of vectorized approach where you're saying okay well can we use meta labeling just to figure out if we should increase or decrease our exposure day on day um in my opinion this is this is the wrong way to apply meta labeling and it again it, it's super hard i've personally never seen any success in forecasting directional size for every single day um, I, I would highly avoid this um, and then the third one is whenever applying meta labeling, specifically if you're using a discretionary trader or somebody who's kind of more of a fundamental investor, if they don't have a lot of trades, um, it's very hard to get meta labeling to work. Uh, first of all, imagine you've only got 56 observations. Let's say it's a model that only trades once a month. You've got 56 months uh, and, and now you're trying to figure out, okay, you know, how can I get meta labeling to add value? Um, you need to remember that we're going to be making a trade-off between recall and precision. And so your model is your your outcome strategy is going to trade less, but its, it's trades will be more successful. And so if you've only got 56 trades, you know, are you comfortable dropping that to say 20 trades? Would you would you still be happy with that? Would that make sense? Also, is it enough data if you did you know a train test split? And so one of the things you can do to kind of combat this is apply the same strategy to different securities, maybe different asset classes. And so you can use the same underlying algorithm uh, and find other assets similar to the asset you're trading or security you're trading. And, you know, in that way, boost the number of trades that you have. Uh, and then uh, another tip is that I would highly recommend that you use feature importance to guide your research because I had seen, and, and there are several blog posts on, on meta labeling, you know, some researchers will say, oh, your meta model should never include any of the features from your primary model. Now, I think that the primary model's features are actually really important because it lets you know, okay, well, this was the market state or this is, was the kind of like information your primary model had. Maybe there's, maybe there's a pattern in that, that, you know, your primary model is getting wrong. And so what you can do is use various feature importance algorithms to determine which features you should use, which features you should select, which features you're going to drop. And we actually have implemented an algorithm from the Journal of Financial Data Science called the model fingerprint. And what this does is it kind of, you know, you pass through your model and you pass through your underlying uh, data, your, your, your feature vector X, and the model outputs three values. The 
linear um, effects, the nonlinear effects, and the pairwise interactions. And so it's very easy to see, oh, this model is exploiting the linear relationships in the first three features, and oh, features two and seven, there's a nonlinear effect, and oh, here's the pairwise interactions, and oh, actually, features three and seven, we could drop, the model is not using it at all. And it's also really useful algorithm for if you're building ensembles and now you want to you know have models that exploit different parts of information and combining them to to get a better forecast so so that's a really useful tool those those are my tips on uh, improving meta labeling so in conclusion uh, meta labeling helps us to address the problem of non stationarity and structural breaks um, by letting us know in what environments is our primary model not likely um, to perform well in. And so you could stop right there and say, okay, well, we're just gonna use that as a binary, trade or not trade. Um, but a, a one up improvement on that is to transform your model outputs from your meta labeling um, to a frequentist probability. And then you could use that in the Kelly criterion to determine your optimal position sizes. Uh, any additional resource, resources that you may be interested in? Um, so again, I'm, I mentioned, you know, our Python package is available on GitHub. It's free, anybody can use it. It's called ML FinLab. We've also written a blog post um, titled Meta Labeling, a toy example, which uses the MNIST data and, and you can very nicely go through it and, and see how we, we structured everything. Um, we have another blog post, does Meta Labeling add signal efficacy, which jumps into the, the toy example technical analysis strategies we gave. There's a whole bunch of online documentation and, and several Jupyter notebooks. And again, this technique comes from Marcus Lopez de Prado. Uh, both of his books, his first book introduces the technique and then his second book kind of clarifies any uh, miscommunication, misunderstanding um, of it. And yes, thank, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I, I'll, I'll be here afterwards if, if anybody has any questions. Thank you.